Oh, Pussycat, I'm so glad to hear your voice. Welcome to the 3% Podcast. This is Chad Post from Open Letter Books. I'm here with Tom O'Bearish from Albertine and New Directions. And we have a special guest this week, uh, Julia Berner Tobin from Feminist Press. Um, she's one of the editors, and she's coming on the podcast this week to talk about Apocalypse Baby by Virginie DuPont. The book that we were reading for our new, for our, or the most recent book for our ongoing 3% book club, which seems more official now than it ever did in the past. <laughs> Is th- this your second book? I think it's like the fourth. Fourth oh, or okay. fifth, maybe? Yeah, but no one ever talked about it until you guys did at Feminist Press. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're really excited that you chose Apocalypse Baby because multiple staff members listen to 3%, so it's especially <laughs> exciting for us. That's pretty awesome. So um, before we get into the book itself, you wanted to say a bit like um, about your position at Feminist Press and about Feminist Press in general? Yeah, um, so I'm an editor at the Feminist Press. I'm one of two, and our publisher is Jennifer Baumgartner. I'm also the foreign rights manager, um, and the Feminist Press has been pretty dedicated to works in translation since our founder, Florence House, started the press in 1970, <laughs> and we're really continuing that. We're Virginie Dipont's um, American publisher. We've published King Kong Theory by her, and we're coming out with Bye Bye Blondie by her in spring of 2016. Oh, wow. um, um, so she's a wonderful representative of the kind of works in translation that we're really dedicated to here. Um, so another reason why we're glad you chose Apocalypse. Yeah, I, the, you guys had a book on the Best Translated Book Award list last year too, right? Textile by Orly Castell Bloom. Yes, mm-hmm. that was another one. Um, and another huge, a huge book in translation that we've had that's had a lot of attention is Testo Junkie by uh, Paul Bree Preciado. Have either of you read that? I haven't. Uh, you're, I don't even know what her title is. Jisoo sent me a copy. Um, oh, but great. I'm sitting on my... Yeah, you uh, carry it at Albertine, right? We do. Um, that is Virginie's partner? Ex-partner, I believe. Ex-partner, Okay. <laughs> Wasn't yeah. sure about that. Yeah, I think so. Um, hopefully, this is not news to the world. But, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, that was a. We're really excited. That's such a huge seller for us because you know it's a nonfiction work in translation, and it's one of our bestsellers. So, have you, so yeah. Have you found that your nonfiction books do better than the fiction books, or vice versa? Uh, I think we publish so much more fiction and translation that it's really just testo junkie that yeah. kind of skews things in the direction of nonfiction because it does so well. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do so much more fiction and translation that I would say that that does better as a whole. This makes sense. So I guess to talk to start talking about this book, um, Tom, do you want to explain why you chose it? Why I chose it? Well, I guess the obvious thing is, because I had already read it when we were talking about which book to read next, um, because I had had a galley, and, you know, working at Albertine, I'm well aware of uh, Virginia's importance in the French literary scene. Um, I think I got the galley right at about the time that Vernon Subotex, the the first volume of Vernon Subotex came out. Um, So she was, you know, Getting attention then, it was on the bestseller list. We had customers coming in, you know, demanding copies of it um, for several <laughs> weeks in a row. They would just come in and be like, do you have the new Depont? And that was it, and that's all they wanted, and they left, and it was great. Um, so I was reading that at the same time as that was all happening, and so I read it, and I think it's absolutely amazing. Um, and it's also, I think, and look, I love King Kong Theory. I think it's a great book, but they're so different, and this one feels so much more like a novel in a way that um, some of her other books haven't, I think. And it feels so expansive and everything that, um, at least for us, for what I think our general tastes are uh, in terms of the books we've chosen for this, it felt like a good fit. And, of course, the obvious thing, which is I don't think we had had a female novelist uh, as our book club book yet. So it was time. I think you're right. Did, so, Julia, did you work on the editing of this book? 
Yeah, I copy edited this book. Um, it was acquired by the former editorial director, Amy Shoulder. Um, uh-huh. And I was the copy editor at that point. And uh, how was that experience? <laughs> <laughs> it was really interesting and exciting, I think, because we were working on uh, the British edition that Serpent's Tale published. Oh. That So it was a little farther removed than if you were just working on the original translation. Mm-hmm. So I would say I, I feel like I wanted to have a slightly lighter hand because I was an indirect um, conversation with the translator at that point. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and just to mention, just so because we haven't done it so far, the translator is Sean Reynolds, um, who actually is, I mean, he's translated a ton of stuff, uh, which I wish I could pull up and explain more, but I know that I've seen his name like four times within the past week, in part because he's in, this is a random digression, but fitting one, he's in the book about um, Scott Moncrief that I'm reading to do the event at Albertine on Thursday. I that, think Sean is a woman, I, I oh, believe. Oh, it is? That I did I not know. So. I'm pretty sure. She, yes. She, she does Vargas. What's that? She does Fred Vargas. Which, oh, right. Which, um, you know, I don't know how many there have been published in English in the U.S., but I imagine in the U.K., probably all of her books have been translated. So, and it's, we're, I mean, they got to be approaching like 10 titles at this point. So. That makes sense. And yep. Yeah, yeah. The Fred Vargas, there's two of those. Carlo, Lu- oh, no, 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 wrong person. Yeah. There's a ton of them in the database, all the Fred Vargas books. Sure. Yeah. Plus, like, a few other people. Anton Varen, uh, Jacques Bonnet. Well, I apologize for not knowing that that was a... That, oh, that's fine. A, a, <laughs> a female translator. Wait, she did the Varen? Uh, let me double-check that. The, um... Yep. Yeah, from Mackelhouse. Yeah, I'm totally blanking on the name of the book. Uh, um, Bed of Nails? Bed of Nails, yes. In French, it's called the Faker, Fakir, so... Oh... Uh, which I think in an American audience would just not understand what that is. Um, right. So thus they had to come up with a bed of nails, which makes sense. But <laughs> True. I thought that anyway. Reading, anyway, reading Apocalypse Baby, I thought this is a perfect you book, Tom. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really right in my, my sweet spot. It's, <laughs> it's, it's got all that. I loved what you, know. you wrote, Tom. I, lo- I loved what you wrote uh, about how. This is a book. You were like, everyone would love this book. Everyone, because that's how I felt as soon as I finished it. I couldn't stop talking about it. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate that a lot of books that Feminist Press does, I'm sure, get this horrible ghettoized treatment. And everyone thinks that everything is going to be this sort of coded manifesto in novel form. And it's just really not true for most of the books you publish. And especially, I think, DePont gets this because of what King Kong Theory was and Best Moi and all of these sorts of things. And it's unfortunate that a lot of readers are just like, oh, that's just not my thing. And this is just mm-hmm. not that. This is a truly, like, breakneck, like... I don't want to call it a thriller, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a chase, a hunt, a detective sort of thing. And it's Mm -hmm. just so fast paced and so political and so fascinating and just so it flows so well that I can't imagine anyone who's into literary fiction, you know, disliking this. Yeah. I mean, I think it doesn't, it doesn't tell you what to think about everything that it's putting out there about French society, about technology and our generation and race and class. It puts all of these different characters um, and all of these things that they're going through, but it doesn't, she doesn't tell you, like, this is what you're supposed to think about this or what this is what feminism is and this is how I'm interpreting it. And that's something that I think we're really trying to do with our books. That's a good point. Do one of you, for the benefit of anyone who did not read this prior to listening to the podcast, want to summarize the book itself? Um, <laughs> sure. So basically, it starts with a um, sort of hapless, I don't want to say disinterested, but, you know, she has a job as a private detective. She's sort of low down on the rung and, you know, on the corporate ladder. And she is tasked generally with just, you know, trailing you know, potentially cheating spouses and apparently trailing your kids is a new thing. So she does a fair amount of that. And and she's good, if you can say that at her job, if only because she's so forgettable and <laughs> lacking in personality, she just sort of disappears into the background. So she's tasked with tracking this, I forget how old the girl is, 13, 14? 15, and, I think. And she suddenly, like, vanishes, like, from from her tale, from, from everything. She appears to be just gone from Paris. And 
turns out that her father is a well-known author and that the mother-in-law or the yeah that, so he's yeah, mother-in-law the mother-in-law is really you know protective of the the family's sort of status and i think you're thinking of the grandmother the grandmother is very protective of the status and is the one right. who hires so, yeah right so his okay. his second wife's mother yes um they're worried about being de classe and all of this sort of thing and so they they really make a big stink about finding her and all of this and so that's when um the hyena gets brought into the picture and she is a legendary sort of um private detective um known partly for just her instinct in being able to find people in spots where others wouldn't look and partly for like her aggressive nature in, in terms of questioning people. And, you know, it's unclear how much of it is true. And it's, you know, she is certainly, you know, given a, a, a legendary status um, by, by description from secondhand accounts. And, and then you meet her and she is, you know, larger than life sort of personality. And so these two get paired up and, are tasked with tracking down uh, the missing girl and drags it, it ends up bringing them all over Paris in and around a bunch of different social circles. And, um, and I mean, all kinds like, you know, dumb, young punk rock teenagers to, um, I, are they Algerian, North African immigrants mm-hmm. to, and then they had often, they're in Spain and there's a, a sort of, uh, the, the ex, her real mother, the, the, the writer's ex-wife is there, so that's why they think she went there. Um, they end up sort of crashing at one of the hyena's friend's place, and it's sort of like a, you know, a commune situation. And it's, they're, they're all over and, um, you know, just trying to track her down and trying to figure out why she would have left. And the way it's written, you get um, these sort of uh, – it, it switches to – sort of third-person omniscient, if I'm correct, um, mm-hmm. of different various characters. So you do get a chapter that is the the girl's real mother living in Spain. You get her perspective on the meeting with the hyena. And you get um, the, the Algerian or whatever he is, cousin of the girl. You get his take on having met the detectives and that sort of thing, and then of their relationship and the cyberpunk sort of, you get his perspective and all of these sorts of things. And um, to me, what's stuck out from having all of those perspectives is like the own personal hells that we all create for ourselves that, that seems so unnecessary um, and yet aided by the way of contemporary culture and society. And, and, you know, nothing is making it easier to sort of let yourself off the hook and, and just, you know, be a, a normal person. It just seems almost impossible. And, and, you know, it's just like this endless cycle of, you know, misery, basically. <laughs> But I won't give the ending. <laughs> An endless cycle of misery seems to summarize the Tom Robert's book pretty well. Yes. But uh, because my friend Doug uh, complained to us before about, uh, you know, ruining the, uh, the endings of these book club books, I feel like we, we basically cannot even talk about the last 50 or 100 pages. So, yeah. Yeah, I think especially with this one, I would say. Yes. Well, it's definitely I, feel like not. I definitely left out a part... A, a person they go to visit that I don't want to give away. Right. I How did I do? That's pretty solid. Great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I think the thing that you pointed out is the part that I like the best too, of like the um, switching and char- giving these character studies of each of the people that they're encountering along the path to finding the girl or to trying to find the girl. Um, and I like that, that sort of shifting perspective with like the, the, like you say, it sort of is a thriller. There is like that sort of speed to it. And that sort of writing to it of like trying to find this person and there's something to be uncovered and, and there's like hints of stuff. Um, but it's not like a straightforward mystery by any means. Um, but the way that it characterizes all the different people and allows them each to speak in that voice, I think is really interesting. It makes it multifaceted. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that Dave Plant chose Lucy as the one first person narrator mm-hmm. in the text. And she's such, she really fades into the background, but in a way, I think the hyena at one point, who's the the investigator that's experienced, says to her, like, it's your apathy that makes you strong. And like, I see it at this point that this whole time you've been so apathetic is actually this source of strength for you. So I think their their relationship is something that I, I found to be really, really interesting throughout as the hyena takes the lead on these um, questioning and how Lucy sees her 
what Lucy's vision of the hyena was, I thought was pretty, she's a larger than life character through Lucy's eyes. So I thought, yeah, there's their relationship was great. Yeah, I completely agree. I also like the, um, the way that each one of the people that that's presented is almost not stereotypical, but like plays to some of the stereotypes of that, that set. Like a, a good example, it might be the father as the writer who's sort of like pretentious, more obsessed with like, finding some young woman to sleep with than anything else um, mm-hmm. is a, you know, middling uh, middle-aged crappy writer sort of respected, but not really, you know, that popular anymore. And like it, they, it sort of plays to that type. And even like, even to some degree that Algerian character is like complicated, but interesting in terms of, I think he is Algerian, right? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Algerian. Um, yeah. He's, he's complicated, but also plays to like that, that, the position of that person within French society. And I think that makes it really interesting as well. And that all of these things are sort of presented w- with a, a undertone of maybe some, not really, she, like you guys said at the beginning, she's not telling you how to think about them, but there is some sort of, not judgment, but it's putting them out there in a way that you can react to them in a way that I think may, makes the book much more interesting. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a whole bunch of crap that I just said, but whatever. <laughs> no. no, I think that's true. I think it's true in that, and I, I think it speaks a little bit to what they um, sort of envisions this book to be, and and sort of transforms it into a, um, a political book. In in that it it puts all of these things together in in a way that you know if you're addressing any of these issues in culture or in politics or in other pieces of art, it generally doesn't get done. And that you know there are a lot of problems in in. France. Let's let's just use France. There's a lot of problems going on that that all do sort of feed into each other. You know, there is this problem with you know the general sort of apathy towards politics and and you know what to do with the people on the far left who still feel like you know what they want to accomplish is nowhere near being accomplished. And then you have the Algerian and other African immigrants issue. You know, all of those situations. And then of course feminism is still an issue. And all of these things get brought together in the plot in a way. But like you said, Julia, it's like she's not telling you what to think. She's just putting them next to each other in order to sort of enhance our ways of talking about them and thinking about them as readers. And mm-hmm. it sort of gives you this impression like, oh, my God, like so much is wrong and mm-hmm. so much of it is feeding into each other. And she doesn't offer any solutions at all. No. Um, except, you know, a little bit of, you know, blow it up and start all over again. But it's it's. It's not like a, a subtle, like she's trying to say that, you know, if we were all just more compassionate or any of these sorts of things, like she has no time for that sort of stupid sort of suggestion. She, she's really just throwing this all in your face for the, the, for the purpose of throwing it in your face, which a lot of times just needs to be done, you know? Mm-hmm. I think and it doesn't yeah. come off as like, I never, I didn't finish this feeling depressed. I mean, I, I felt depressed about the world, but I also felt really <laughs> excited. <laughs> and I feel like that's kind of an amazing reaction to this book is that it's, it's partly in the way that it's written in such a fast paced kind of like noir way. And she's in this way that she's writing about these characters or she's writing these characters. It's funny and she's making fun of them. And she, it kind of feels like she's making fun of you too. And it's hard. I didn't come away with it thinking like there's no hope, even though <laughs> it, what she's putting forth, it kind of feels like that because of something in the way that she wrote this book. There's, and that, I think that's absolutely true. And I think it's interesting that like the, um, the thriller mystery part of it in the sense of like trying to find the missing girl who goes run away or vanished and anything for a long time, it's how that like anything could have happened to her. It's sort of like the perfect, um, way the perfect thread to be able to hang these other things off of especially because it all does come together in her and she's an interesting and strange character that it would be hard to talk about without giving away too much of the ending but the fact that she doesn't really embody any one of these perspectives that's given off by the other characters but is her own kind of amalgamation of things and like sort of nondescript for a lot of the book even when she gets to talk she's not like as clearly defined i think as some of the other people Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's definitely put out there, at least for a good chunk of this, as a sort of empty vessel, and the other characters are sort of keeping their sort of worldviews on her, and she sort of tries them on, 
But I think what's great about her at the same time is she rejects them when she knows enough about them to have an opinion about them, right? Like, yeah. Which is the, with, this, with all the hackers and everything, she's, you know, she embraces it and she, you know, she feels like she's part of this community. And then all of a sudden she realizes that it's just as hypocritical and, you know, ass backwards as, as any other sort of, you know, really, um, you know, rigid sort of idealism can be. And she rejects it and walks away. And then the, similar things keep happening like that. And I think, and, you know, when she tries to take on the, the plight of the Algerians and everything, it's just the same thing happens. And it's, she's smart enough, even in her, you know, youth to understand that there are flaws in what all of these people think in their rigidity. And, um, at the same time, they all make her smarter and they, they keep propelling her forward to sort of be curious about other things. Um, and of course, using the missing girl as a plot is perfect because it is one of these things that like, you will not get more time on the news than if you're a suburban, wealthy, white girl who goes missing. And it is, it's like all of Western society's, you know, fundamental you know, worst nightmare is this thing we can all agree on that there's nothing worse than a missing young girl. Right. And so it, it really is the perfect thing to sort of build this plot around. I do have a question for you, Julia. Are you guys doing Vernon Subutext as well? We're in negotiations right now. So fingers Hopefully. crossed on that. <laughs> is that? <laughs> yeah. At, Cause I haven't, I mean, I know of King Kong theory and, and vice Ma and everything like that, but I haven't read the other two books of hers. Um, how does this one compare in your mind to the other two? I know you mentioned Tom that is very different because it was less theoretical, right? I wouldn't say yeah. that you don't. Go ahead. less theoretical, but it's just done in a very different way. Oh, is okay. that fair, Julia? I actually have only read Apocalypse. I need to read King Kong Theory and I'm about to dive into Bye Bye Blondie editing that. So I would, you should answer that one, Tom. <laughs> I will. I mean, King Kong theory is, and you know, she will say this. And, and in fact, you know, when I first encountered that book, I thought, okay, this is, you know, theory. This is, you know, a memoir, if if anything, not fiction. Um, and it's hard to classify. It is so much about her own experiences, um, and and she plainly admits that. And yet, it is, you know, it's got a novelistic sort of tone to it in that she's not, she's not like a classical theorist. She does not lay something out and make an argument. She's more interested in sort of unpacking her experiences and seeing how they fit in with the rest of culture and how she fits in, you know, how her experiences fit in with what other theorists have to say about her experiences and her own thoughts about her, her experiences and that sort of thing. And so it reads very much like, you know, a, a part memoir, part theory. And this is, of course, just straight up novel. I mean, I, I do think there's probably a little bit of Virginie in this book, but, you know, placing that honor is, is totally unfair. I don't think that's, you know, totally accurate. And King Kong Theory and Bessemar both very much like drawing on her, her experiences and her youth and, you know, mining them for good for what was emotional and powerful and what, um, what needs to be shared and told and that sort of thing. But they're definitely not you know, novels in that sense. That's interesting. Do you know anything about Bye Bye Blondie? I haven't read that one. I don't know much about it, to be honest. And it was also made into a film. As well as Best Moi? She directed. Yeah. She made Best Moi, and Best Moi into a I film think, herself. Um, was it a film with Marianne Cotillard? Did I? I think that... Is that true? It is. Um, it, is it called Bye Bye Blondie? The yeah, yeah, yeah. And she did direct it as well. It's got Emmanuel Biart, Beatrice Dalle, Soko Clara Ponceau. I don't know who any of these people are. I also don't know films very well at all. But yeah, it's it's it it was made in a film in 2012, and is listed on Internet on Movie Database as a comedy slash drama. Hmm. Comedy, huh? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know about, about all of those things. Um, but yeah, because it seems. Seems interesting. Like this seems like um, I'm curious to see. Like to go back and read her earlier books that haven't translated, and Bye Bye Blondie, and then if if you guys get it, the Vernon Subu text because I think that they seem it's it's interesting to watch her career continue to grow from like something like Base Mall, which seems very like 
direct and charged and aggressive and specific. And then King Kong Theory be a reflection on that. And then these seem more like novels. They're more like traditional novels in some sense. But in a way, you mm-hmm. know who I kept thinking of when I was reading this too? Although the writing styles are completely different. I kept thinking of Kathy Acker during the time that I was reading it in the sense of like this kind of like fucking with things and knowing that everything's a, a mess and that there's no one good solution and and there's fun to be had in writing and things things that are sort of in the middle are the best um, where they're just kind of going instead of like clear beginnings and endings. So I don't know. I thought that just kept coming to mind, but I was also been thinking a lot about Kathy Acker. So I suppose was primed for that. I would say that King Kong theory is, is a bit like Kathy, Ac- Kathy Acker, but um, there's not a whole lot of fun in, in <laughs> King Kong theory. I mean, there is, there is some playfulness at the end. It's, it's when she's finally coming around at the end of that book. I mean, it's whatever, 150 pages, but when she comes around to sort of, trying to ask questions about the previous 100 pages, she does have a sort of lighthearted uh, way of, you know, critiquing everything um, and even addressing readers and that sort of thing. Kathy Acker, I think, is more experimental, I would oh, say. Yeah. Um, and especially in terms of, you know, constantly the, 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 the need to just unseat everything and... I, I think Virginie wants to do that. It's just she does it with a little bit more finesse than Kathy Acker, which they're just different styles. You're absolutely yeah, right. totally different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tom, and you said you read Vernon Subutex, right? No, I actually I started reading it maybe three weeks ago, and then I had to put it down to read uh, the Kamel Daoud because I was um, trying to interview him, although that's proven very difficult. Um, that's the, the Marceau Contre Enquête, the book that's like a sort of retelling of The Stranger from the oh, yeah. Arab, that Arab's point of view. Um, anyway, so I put that down, and um, and then I read a Baudrillard book, and now I, I literally just today spent a couple hours reading the first 50 pages of it. It okay. is definitely more like Apocalypse Baby than, than any of her other previous books, that's for sure. Yeah, anyone I know who's who's read it, it's like their, their favorite of all of her work, so I was interested to hear your opinion. Yeah, so far it's fantastic. I mean, it's, again, like this really fast-paced sort of diving right in and, and getting dirty right away, and it's great. It, and that's supposed to be a trilogy, right? No, I think it's just two. My oh, own. it's just two? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's why she couldn't, uh, she was supposed to come to the bookstore and mm-hmm. I, I I know what <laughs> she was, uh, finishing up editing her volume two, which I think is due to come out in July in trance. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, we were bummed, but still, we were so excited that you guys were still stocking so many. That's wonderful. But we didn't have the events that we wanted. <laughs> I should tell you brief pause here. Um, we had Molly Crabapple at the store. Um, for a weird sort of event, but, um, <laughs> we, uh, she, uh, we were talking, she and I were talking afterwards about it and she's like, I, I love this fucking book. It's so fucking fantastic. Everyone should read it. This is just amazing. I begged them to do the cover. I, I love this so much. And uh, she went on and on and on. She loved it. And oh, I'm so happy to hear that. That's so, that's great. Her cover is amazing. We are so happy with it. I didn't realize that that was her cover. It's listed on yeah. the back. It's not on the galley. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, no, it's not on the galley at all. That's funny. Our bad. It's our bad. Yeah. That... <laughs> Sorry, Molly. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> I think the three covers together are kind of an amazing collection of art. The Grisset, uh Serpent's Tail, and our cover. It's, we've all gone in such different directions, but... They're pretty, they're great Oh, my God. This reminds me of, uh, oh, my God. So we had a little stack of the French edition, the what's in the, the, the whatever, mass market, post edition, on a table. And, you know, Saturday afternoon, there's tons of families in the store. And these two boys walked by the, the little pile of King Kong theory. And in English, I could hear them talking about um, how big King Kong was in real life. <laughs> And I was just like, these two boys are having this conversation based on this. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> That's pretty great. Too bad they didn't buy the book, but oh well. 
I think I like your cover the best. Uh, the, I like the um, the Anadi one as well. The, the Italian one is, is, is interesting. One. It's kind of more in vain with yours. I don't like the Serpent's. I think this is the Serpent's Tail one with just the with the car. Yeah, that's not my favorite. I like the Grisse one a lot. Is that the yellow one? It's the yellow yeah. one. Yeah, like yep. the little. It looks like armless and legless child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of like maybe yeah. wrapped Fatigued. up somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do like that one as well. I feel like, dude, don't there other versions of her books have similar sort of matching covers or something? I guess I haven't seen those. I'm trying to look for them now. Yeah, me too. I thought I've, I guess I've just seen those three. Uh, let me. You're looking for the German and the Italian? Yeah, I just looked for the French one. The French ones are, they don't all match quite the same. No, they don't. They're not, uh, they don't all go together. I will say King Kong Theory and Apocalypse Baby look like a nice pair when you put them together. But. Yeah. That's good. And then the, the Vernon Super Text. Those two match. Out the bookstore because it's so unlike every other <laughs> format edition. Like, it's just, you know, it looks like spray paint or something. And, you know, everything else is like this austere, bare, white cover with the author's name and a title and no image. Yeah, that's, a, I mean, that's like the, the exact opposite of the traditional French cover. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we definitely get people who come in and they're like, why is everything white? I just think very highly of themselves. <laughs> do you, yeah, do you, how do you feel about that, having to market them and everything? What do you mean? Compa- uh, like the, the covers, the fact that they are just like the matching, or a good number of them are the matching singular sort of design it's really thing. It's like you, you'll put like all the new books on the table together, and you're like, okay, these all look exactly the same. <laughs> it's really hard to you know try to make it for easy for people to distinguish which one they're looking for. It, it's yeah, and and they really French publishers don't try you know they don't try to help you out in terms of plot or sensibility at all. No on the covers, you know. I mean, it's just a title and a name, and you've got to know what it is and. They were really relying on their publicity at that point, you know? As I, you know, it's interesting. Um, do you have to then, do you feel as a bookseller that you need to know, know more about the books to help direct people because there is a lack of those sort of clues, um, visual or, or written clues that most people have when you go into a bookstore? A little bit. Um, it's especially frustrating because you can often, you know, I don't know why more I don't know, maybe they do, but when I was a bookseller at first, I would always, you know, sort of summarize the plot and tell people what it's about. And then at a certain point, I realized, well, you can just give people like six books, save your breath, and then tell them to go sit down and look through all, because the back of the book says a lot about it, right? right? And French editions generally don't, like, I think that the copy on Vernon Sobotex is like, who is she? She's a legend, and it, it goes on to, like, it says, like, four other sentences, but they're all in that vein, and you're like, there's no plot here. That's it. You have to know what kind of books she's written, or you you just have no idea, you know? And so, yeah, you do have to sort of, you can't rely on the, the, the publisher's copy to sort of help you out uh, very often. So, yeah, you got to know a little bit more about plots. And, and this is, like, books even that I would never read in a million years. I'm just like, oh, God, i got to go do some yeah. research on this, you know? That's kind of how I felt. I just went to London Book Fair, and I, I met with a lot of French publishers. And unlike some of my other meetings, the French publishers would just sort of give me the cat, their catalog and be like, as you know, you know all of these authors now, like, choose what you're interested in, <laughs> rather than, like, you're the best three, like, for your catalog specifically, you're going to love them. It was like, here you go. Now go, like, think about these amazing authors. So it was, it was funny to see the difference in that way. I did have a conversation with someone in um, in turn because I was there briefly for the book fair about how awful it is to to listen to like a billion people in a row at one of those book fairs where each one of them wants to describe the complete plot of every single book in their catalog. Um, so we were we were going the opposite way where he's like the second that they they start with a plot, I'm going to give them a warning, and if they violate it, I'm just going to throw their catalog <laughs> off the table. <laughs> just be like, Your time is done. <laughs> no more plot descriptions. <laughs> See, I guess I wanted some of that. I think I was, it was my first fair, and I'm like, tell me everything you know, rather than, here you go, silence. So. There, there, should be, 
you got to have at least a couple sentences. A know? couple sentences. We said like two sentences, fine. Yeah. But when it's like yeah. the, the five minute ones, or it's like, and then they drive their car and meet with the uh. mother, and then the mother has this thing, and they go swimming, and you're like, God damn it, get to the point. <laughs> Just stop. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone who's a foreign rights agent, yourself included, that has to deal with these problems. But, um, but yeah. <laughs> it's a hard, it's hard to find that sweet spot of like, I mean, I usually try to go with huge publicity and that's what people care about in sales figures. And yeah. at that point, that's when, that's what piques people interest more than the, than the plot for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the plot helps because it helps publishers sort of envision how to publish it themselves in their context, I think. Right. I mean, that's why it's done. Mm-hmm. Soon. Right. Yeah, that's true. I don't, I, Definitely. So, like the idea is like, you know, people try on clothes and so that, you know, you can envision yourself wearing it and, you know, the kind of life you could have if you own this dress and that sort of thing. But like, yeah, you can't just say, you know, well, some authors you can like, I think a lot of publishers just buy based on, you know, sales figures or something like that. And that's really sad. And only then do they leave it to their marketing people to figure out how to, uh, you know, put it in context with other books being published at that time or, you know, in books, in booksellers minds as well. Um, Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a tricky business. That's for sure. Publishing your books. It's not just, you know, get it translated properly. It's, it's, it's a lot of different problems. Right. I thought with the, the with the description thing too, like one of the problems I have is like any plot that they tend to give you because they, they boil it down in the somewhat most generic way of describing it um, can be told in 50 different ways, which are radically different. Um, it makes it hard to even tell like if you're trying on like for your clothes metaphor, like what you're trying on here. Is it like, is it like an elegant dress or like a punk rock dress? Either way, they're just saying like, here's a dress that you might wear. You're like, but what 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 is the style and the cut of said dress? But yeah, it's it's a complicated business, I know. Do you guys have it um at um feminist press? So first of all, I know it's your forty fifth anniversary, which just shout out for that. Um, Thank you. Because I just got that email literally this morning. Um, but the other thing, so you guys do mostly with the translations that you're doing. Are you focused um, primarily on French literature? I mean, you've done a number of other languages, but is there any sort of um, program that you guys are trying to implement or things that you're looking for? No, I mean, it's just so happened that recently we've done so many, we've done a lot of French titles. We're doing Mm -hmm. Tres and Isabel by Violette Leduc, which I know we're talking about doing an event at Albertine, Tom. She's awesome. She was awesome. Yeah, it's a beautiful translation by Sophie Lewis. Um, And so, yeah, it's happened that we've done a lot of French books, but we're definitely not, that's not the only the only place that we're translating from. We have Mm -hmm. a book coming up called Beijing Comrades, which is the first um, gay novel out of the PRC that we're really, we're really excited about that one translated by Scott E. Myers. Um, So that's going to be our, let's see, fall 2015 uh, March book. Um, So we're, we're really trying to do, trying to translate from all over the world. And that's, what that's why London was so wonderful. I'm still kind of getting out of this huge pile of books from you know everywhere. <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to decide um, what to acquire because that'll be my first my first international fiction, and I think I'm, I'll do a fiction first. So, um, can I ask? Are you still doing the Femme Fatale series? Yeah, we are. Uh, Stella Dallas is coming out in July, so that's the most. That's our most recent one, and we haven't announced the next one. We're still we're still deciding, but that's a great uh, series for anyone who doesn't know. It's reprints from the '40s and '50s, really sexy noir. And I was I was shocked that those were so popular in London. A lot of publishers are interested in even adopting the whole series. So, so we were excited about that. Uh, I will say, and you know. This, the, the beauty of being uh, having such a specific goal at a bookstore and, and doing only French. I put a pile of uh, by Cecile on the table by uh, Teresa Torres, mm-hmm. and you know it's three years old at this point, three and a half years old. And you know, I, did, I didn't know about it when it first came out, and read it. I don't know when, maybe a year ago. And so when we were at the store, I was like, oh, I'll get like five of these. It sold in like a week, and I keep reordering, reordering it. 
because it's new it's new to our customers you know and that's the, the thrill mm-hmm. is like these things that you know maybe when they come out they just they didn't quite catch on and you can still get people interested in them um yeah i, I find so that I, the design of those does so does very well for them i mean they're really they're small sexy little books with old photos of women and it, they just at like the brooklyn book festival do really well people are always pick them up first so i'm but i'm happy to hear they're selling well do you yeah, have women's barracks? Really we do. I haven't read that one yet, so maybe it's not selling as well just because of that. But um, mm-hmm. um, and I also read Bunny Lake is missing. Is that in that series? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I haven't. Well, I have another. I have an edition of that from like the sixties or something like that in like this really old British edition. Um, cool. I spent a lot of time buying old mass markets from. Guys who sell them on the streets near NYU. Um, and, <laughs> and they had, and Bunny Lake is Missing uh, is fantastic. Yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good one too. Hey, can I interrupt the podcast for one second to make a, a special announcement? Yeah. Yeah. The, the winner of the Pen- Man Booker International was just announced. Oh, really? Crash and Horkai. Lasno Crash and Horkai, yes. I had a feeling that was, yeah, he was going to win. That's great. Congratulations to New Directions and to him. You yes. know, all of his other publishers around the world. But... <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Very happy for him. You guys He's a... one of those authors. He really appreciates this sort of thing, too. I mean, you've met him, yeah. Chad, right after he got that award. And he really, really appreciates this sort of honor and recognition and understands what it means to, like, win something like this in, you know, when you're up against other great writers and that sort of thing. He's, he's very humbled and, and um, very appreciative. So anyway, we can I, continue. I feel like I looked up like who won just with relation to that really quick. Um, in the past, and it's, it's been a lot of American and English writers. So it's good that someone outside of that. Yeah, the last two, last three were Alice Munro, Philip Roth, Lydia Davis. So that goes back to 2009. Wow. And 2007 was Chinua Chibe. Who wrote mostly in English too. So Ismail Kader was the only non-English writer that had won prior to Crash and Harkai. and that was in 2005. So and it's only every other year. Yeah, it's only every other year. So it's five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, yep. now fifteen. So it's only five or only six winners now. But that's really cool that he won. He was there. I saw a picture of him an hour or so ago arriving. You know, <laughs> in a in a suit or whatever. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, anyway, we've gotten off track a little bit. Is there anything else to say about the book that you know we can say without without giving away giving anything away? Um, because I do, you know, a lot of the books I think we all read don't generally, you know, hinge on sort of plot in the end. Like you could talk about the entire plot, and the beauty of these books generally isn't in what you know takes place from getting from point A to point B. But this one, it really matters, I think. And, and so I don't want to give anything away. So, but what can we say about it, you know, otherwise that, uh, that we haven't mentioned at this point? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well then, um, you know, I think as I was looking back, back through it, I was just, I was remembering as while I'm, I was copy editing it that it, I really saw the whole, the whole book in my mind and I find it to just be so cinematic. And I know we're talking about others of her books that have become movies, but I could just see this one being like a huge hit. Um, and I think her writing lends itself to that and, and all of these different characters, I can picture them in my mind. And when a book can do that, it's, it's special. So, yeah, is there, this one was the first book of hers to win an award, correct? Yeah, it won um, the, let's see, Pre Rendau. Ren, Ren, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Pre Renaudo? <laughs> Pre Renaudo, maybe? I have no, that's up to you, Tom. Renaudo? Renaudo? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, and then Vernon wow. Chibutex. It's also, you passed on saying the first name in that prize. I did? Yeah, there's, it's actually the Pre Tail Frost. Renando, it's un- <laughs> wow, that is a hard name to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. I just took the last few words. <laughs> yeah, everyone just says Renando. So, Renando. Okay, good. Wow. Man. 
Um, and she just won a prize for Vernon Subotex. I'm totally blanking on what it's called. The Anias Nin? Yeah, that's it. Oh, wow. Um, which is a, a grant, basically, to help it get translated. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. It's the first one, too. Yeah, the first of its of the award. Yeah, so $5,000 towards the translation. And I think it, it is specifically into English, or no? Uh, I, I, don't, I, feel, I didn't think so, but maybe. I might be wrong. That might make sense, if only because that's what Anais Nin, I mean, she wrote in English and French and translated herself, which is a weird thing. Um, that was my impression, but I could be wrong. It was brand new. Like, when we heard she won, I was like, what, what is this? No one knows. Yeah. No one knows. <laughs> <laughs> Recent winners of the pre Renault Doe. Let's see what else. Did they not give it out in 2014? That's weird. Oh, I no, think I, it, I thought it was a new. Am I wrong? I thought it was a new. Oh, prize. no. It's the Renault Doe. It's from 1926. Oh. <laughs> wow. Oh, Charlotte won this year? Huh. Limonoff won from Carrere. Scholastic Mukasanga is one. Oh, yeah. Take a very good collection of writers. Oh, Namaski, yeah. Fladell won. Mabanku. Yep. He was up for the... Uh, the thing, the man Booker, Booker thing. Yeah. So is Caesar Ira. Yes. He had all the... Yes. Yeah, this is a pretty solid list. Yeah. Yeah, I have nothing else to add except that it was, it was a nice book to read on the plane. Because it was, it was engaging and not like... Uh, uh, one of the books that you have to like reread every sentence and rethink through things is like it had that that kind of uh, grippingness to it, the thriller nature to it, and is very enter- engaging and entertaining to read in the airport. kept me kept me going through my whole flight. So <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> it's also one of those great covers and titles where other people see it and they're like, "There's always that second glance, like what what, what could that possibly be?" Yeah. What- Book yeah, a lot of our titles that I've gotten that look on the subway, like the feminist porn book people have asked about, <laughs> Rape New York, <laughs> like, <laughs> Spread. <laughs> so it's, it's often, and we've been doing this, a lot of our books have this really like bold, large typeface with with these words, and Slut is another one. So oh, right. yeah. we get a lot, yeah, we make a <laughs> splash. <laughs> You, yeah, that's that is perfect. <laughs> I like that. Oh man. Um. So I don't. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add except we need to. Well, we should figure out for the future another um book to include next in the to continue doing this. But one other thing that I want to make an announcement for is that I don't think I don't know when we'll be able to record this. Probably in a couple weeks. So probably a week after anyone hears this. But then this episode is our ninety ninth. And the next one that we record will be the 100th. So Tom's proposed having a, a listener appreciation podcast in which we just answer questions that people tweet and or email us um, for the whatever, however long that takes. So any question that you've ever had about anything whatsoever that we can try and answer, you should email to the 3% po- or to just 3% podcast at gmail.com. Um, so if you're listening to this or tweet it at Tom. Or you. Or me. But you, you're much better at all those things. <laughs> I, I'm on there so infrequently. But, but uh, yeah, just tweet us or, or email, and we will read off all of the questions and answer them to the best of our ability. Or make fun of them mercilessly. Or make fun of them mercilessly. Unfortunately, there's no one wrote in about this book at all. I just checked. Mm. They might after. I think they generally people write in after we've talked about it. That's true. And then, and then they point um, out things that we did wrong <laughs> or said wrong, <laughs> which I was thinking I should, for the event on Thursday, I should say Prowse the entire time, Tom, and just keep <laughs> going with that. The, the famous translator Prowse and someone would correct me and just keep on, <laughs> just ignore it. Yeah. Just, you know, you have a problem where you just can't say the word for you know? <laughs> ever, <laughs> just never right. Um, Anyways, I guess we were supposed to do our raves and rants, but I don't, again, don't remember which one we have. You are on rave. Um, I have a rant, which I have not shared with you, but I'm going to email to you right now if you're looking at your email. Oh, sh- it's send it to Gmail. Send it to Gmail. Okay. 
because this is pretty fantastic. I don't know if you saw it. Um, a wonderful article that appeared on Jezebel, I think in the wake of, uh, so galleys of um, Jonathan Franzen, our favorites. Yes. Of uh, derision here. <laughs> um, galleys of his new book went out and it opens with, oh God, like the worst sentence ever. Here we go. Oh, wonderful. Uh, oh, pussycat, I'm so glad to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, Madeline boy. Davies at Jezebel, um, and I won't read the, the introduction to it, but she basically, um, while reading Friends and started recognizing all these really bad um, descriptions of sex. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and saving them up, waiting for the appropriate time to make a post out of this. And now that this new horrible book called Purity is coming out, um, she decided. Uh, so, where's the money quote here is, well... This is the best one. <laughs> Connie had a wry, compact intelligence, a firm little clitoris of discernment and sensitivity. <laughs> I, I feel like the, um, that part of, uh, of the last book, Freedom, wasn't that up for the, the Bad Sex Award? I mean, I, does it have enough for there to be? Oh, I, I, I'm almost 100% sure that it was one of the finalists. Mm-hmm, I think so. God. Bad sex in fiction. Yeah, let's see. Bad sex in fiction. That's funny. What was your <laughs> I like, I like the that. Used to that, but you never like see who won. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. The compiled sort of nominations is hilarious, and no one ever follows up on who won. Yep. No, he was on there for uh, for this. Um, oh, the headline Jesus. I see is. Jonathan Franzen can't even win the Bad Sex Award. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can actually read this. I'm not entirely sure that I would, I could pull this off on here. Um, if you want to, I'll give it a try, though. But he was he was singled out for the judges um, for freedom for a depiction of a phone sex encounter. Um, and then and Time Magazine, which ran this, so I'm going to give this a go, but sorry, guys. I apologize to everyone listening to this. Time Magazine said, this is not so much a spoiler alert as a squeamish alert, so you may not wish to read on. And I quote from Freedom, one afternoon, as Connie described it, her extended clitoris grew to be eight inches long, a protruding pencil of tenderness with which she gently parted the lips of his penis and drove herself down to the base of its shaft. Another day at her urging, Joey described to her the sleek, warm neatness of her turds as they slid from her anus and fell into his open mouth, where, since these were only words, they tasted like excellent dark chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Oh, God. He sucks. You know, you know what I can't figure out, and this is because he's come up a few times on here, too, is that does Ryan Chapman like Franzen's books? Is that possible? He had, like, a thing, on, a picture on Twitter of how he'd gotten the galley and that he was going out to, to read it on his break. And I couldn't tell if he was joking or not. And someone else mentioned this to me. They're like, I think Ryan Chapman really likes Jonathan Franzen. Like, that's he is a possible. Sir, I should point out, Ryan Chapman listens to this podcast. I know. Hey, Ryan, you need to tell us. Come clean. Come, <laughs> come defend your your appreciation of, of Jonathan Franz, and I would love to hear this explained. Oh man. So I I don't I don't even know if I have a rave. I, do you have a rave that something you want to that you're excited about, Julia? That you want to talk to us about? Because <laughs> you can have my rave. <laughs> Uh, well, I think this, I'm sort of late to the party, but do you know Stromae, that artist, that French rapper? I do not. Uh, So maybe I'm not late. I've just been listening to him nonstop, and he has this great video called Tous les Mêmes, um, that I think that both of you should watch. It's like, he's a half, he's half male, half female throughout the video and he does these dances with one side of his face facing the camera that are just wonderful um so i i've been listening to him all day and feeling good about him <laughs> Go, that's that's solid that's thanks fair enough right well done Fred, we should gonna auto start i just clicked on the video and there's a very good chance it'll just get really loud please don't do that okay I will watch it as soon as this is over. I, I will. Great. I will. Tell I, me what maybe, you think. I think maybe we can maybe embed this into the uh, post about the the um, podcast and include it at the beginning as the music. <laughs> oh, 
awesome. <laughs> we'll just lead in with that. I'm even more excited now about him then. He'll be on this podcast. Great. There we go. Um, yeah, I've got nothing. I've got I've 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 not had time to rave about anything. I've been traveling way too much. From the consortium. How was thing. the book fair there? I don't know. I didn't really do anything there. Like that was that was great. That was great because like I didn't have to do shit. Like I, I was there specifically to give one presentation that was a half an hour long. Um, oh. So and I didn't because I didn't want to be part of the fair because I, I was coming back because it was my son's birthday and my parents are coming to town. And um, so uh, I came, flew in on Wednesday morning and got there like Wednesday afternoon, gave a speech on Thursday and flew out Friday morning. So That's... I walked through the fair and I saw like where they had all the rights tables and I, I went out to, um, to, Oh, I do have, I do have a funny story. This is sort of my rave. My rave is for, my rave is for dark, dingy Irish bars. And the, um, <laughs> I went, when I got in on Wednesday, um, the champions league semifinal, the second leg of the semifinal between Juventus, which is based in, who's based in Turin where I was, and Real Madrid was going to take place. And so I went down to the front desk and I asked the, the woman there, I was like, so is there a place nearby where I can watch the soccer match and get something to eat and have a beer? And she's like, oh, no, no, there's not. And I'm like, really? Like, we're like in the middle of a city. Like, there has to be a place. And she's like, well, there is. But it's this Irish bar and it's dark. And I don't think they have good food. And I was like, no, that sounds, that sounds perfect. I was like, what kind of food do they have? And she's like, bar food. It's like, this is ideally what I want. It's like, oh, I don't know. It's dark. It's very dark. So I went there. And as it turned out, it's like a completely clean. It was the cleanest Irish bar I think I've ever been in in my life. And like, there were like seven other people from the book fair who were also there skipping the opening ceremony of the book fair to watch this soccer match that Juventus miraculously won and is now in the, the Champions League final against Barcelona. Um, so it was kind of perfect, but I thought it was super funny that like this very Italian woman was just like, oh no, absolutely not. Stupid dark <laughs> Irish bar. No pasta there. <laughs> Anything. So I, I rate for that bar. I like that. What I can't even remember the name of it. I think it was called like Dubliner's Bar, <laughs> like something like that. But it was great. But that's all I've got. Well, that's not bad. This is pretty standard fare. Chad raving about soccer. But hey. yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> true. Well, I didn't even talk about the the game was great, but no, it was fun. Um, it also distracts you from the fact that the Mets beat the Cardinals last night. Oh my God, that was such a crazy good game. I was going to text you about that. But every time that I thought that it was going to end, it didn't end. That was like a spectacular. I think that the, the Mets are going to sweep them, actually. Because I think that they're broken now. The Cardinals are tired and broken, and they've pitched way too many innings from their bullpen. I think they're going to go on a slide for like the next two weeks. That's my, that's my prediction. I'm, I'm going to choose some of your like Mets gloom and just project it straight into the Cardinals. <laughs> Um, what else? So I will see you both at the New Directions party. Yes. Yep. Hey, did you get an invitation? Great. Send one to uh, Jisoo. I didn't. I don't think I got one, but I'll just go. I'll be Jisoo's you, you plus just one. Go with her. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, you and four hundred of my closest bookselling slash publisher <laughs> friends. It'll be great. <laughs> That's gonna be fun. I'm excited about that. Yeah, it'll be fun. Um, it always is. Always really crowded, but always really fun. Yeah. That's probably, like, that's one of the very few things I'm excited about in relation to Book Expo. Um, yeah, all I'm doing, because I never go to Book Expo, I just go to all the parties. And this year, there's a lot of good parties. So, I'm into that. There we go. I don't. I only know of, like, the our Best Translated Book Award one, which hopefully I'll see you at, too, if you're not working. And then uh, your one, and... The Amazon Books one. Won't be going to that. Um, <laughs> there's an LRB one on Friday, and the Europa's 10th anniversary is on oh, Tuesday. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that one. Yeah, that too. And anyway, uh, Chad, I will see you on Thursday. Yep, it'll be fun. Coming down well, on the so train. Thanks so much for having me. This was great. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> great. Um, yes, we'll, uh, we'll have to have you back on next time we pick a, a feminist book for our uh, book club. Yeah, or, great. you know, some other random book. I don't know. You Absolutely. Um, Sounds good to me. I'm glad I ran into you at the party, at the consortium yeah, party. Yeah, me too. That was actually ended up being a pretty fun party. I was not expecting. I always I liked their things. Didn't have I, high hopes, but yeah, it was, it was my first one. I thought it was fun. Oh, yeah. I, I think the fact that they just give you free wine and that 
you can just continue consuming them <laughs> as much as you yeah. want. Makes it yeah. makes it much more interesting. I think I, I was like the last person there <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> well done. Very well Thanks. done. Thank you. But, okay, well I guess I'll talk to you guys soon. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. Bye. Ce serait pire. Quoi toi aussi tu veux finir maintenant? C'est le monde à l'envers. Moi je le disais pour te faire réagir seulement. Toi tu pensais rendez-vous, rendez-vous, rendez-vous au prochain règlement. Rendez-vous, rendez-vous, rendez-vous sûrement au prochain règlement.